So I'm Jesse St. Laurent. I'm the Vice President of Product Strategy for SimpliVity. I, I want to talk for a little bit this morning about data efficiency, because data efficiency really, we believe, is at the core of uh, a lot of the issues that are, that are problematic in the data center today. So there's uh, a few new pieces of content here, which I'm uh, excited. To. We try to make sure whenever we come to a, a Tech Field Day event that there's something new that we haven't shown the world before. So uh, we'll see a few pieces of that here and then the next section as well. So if we look at the, a data center, the same pieces and parts we, uh, we have on a standard infrastructure, right? In terms of storage, primary storage, secondary, backup, all these pieces and parts. One of the stunning questions is just how many times the same piece of data gets processed. So if we look at it, when you write data from the virtual machine, if you're using some type of SSD caching in your system, that may be processing your data. If you write it down into the storage, a lot of systems do processing of data for the storage, the flash or SSD tier within the storage system. In the disk, a lot of systems actually have another process of the data to process for efficiency on the disk side. If that data is then moved into a dev environment, into a secondary environment for reporting, things like that, commonly processed again into that environment. If you write it to the backup environment, it's commonly processed again as it goes to that backup environment. So every time it's being rehydrated, moved to a new location, probably written in full size, and then post-processed, uh, modified on the roadside. Some are in line, some are post-processed. Take one more step, they go through the WAN optimization device. If you're replicating your DR and your backups, the, let's hope that depending on the device, it's intelligent enough to transfer to the remote side uh, the, the data without rehydrating. In most cases, especially on the, the storage side, the systems aren't aware uh, remotely, so especially if it's post-process, you will replicate the data full size and actually process it again on the other side. And then if it goes into a flash array, most flash systems are, are doing some type of efficiency processing. And cloud gateways, when you're moving into the cloud, are doing some type of efficiency processing because the way it matters. So maybe I'm grossly exaggerating the facts, and maybe you don't do it nine different times in your environment. Maybe you do it four times. Still processing the same piece of information, constantly rehydrating and dehydrating, it becomes a, a significant efficiency challenge. And one of the benefits of hyperconvergence, we believe, is, is really driving efficiency. So if, if you take and combine all these features and you use 9x the CPU that you should be in your, uh, your hyperconverged environment, it simply impacts how much stuff you can run on the platform. So from our perspective, the more efficient you can be about processing your data, the more resources in that system are available to run your business application. So customers don't buy boxes to run deduplication, they buy boxes to run Exchange and SQL and SharePoint and all their core business applications. So the same data is processed a bunch, many times, many appliances, many interfaces. We think there's a simple way to do that. Process it once at inception and keep it in that efficient format for its entire lifespan. So never reprocess that data. Hey Brian, can I have the card? Yes. So part of what enables us to do this is, uh, is our accelerator card. So this is installed in every single OmniCube, and uh, we can do a, a close-up after the fact if, want, if folks want to take a look at it. But this is uh, a mixture of a handful of different technologies. It's uh, an FPGA, it's DRAM, there's flash, and you can see a, a bank of supercapacitors on the back of the system. This enables us to very quickly acknowledge writes into the environment and do it in a way that keeps them persisted. I'll come back to that and talk about the details of that and, uh, separately. But what I'll focus on for this is really the fact that this is offloading the, the work here. Not only are we processing it once, but the CPU and uh, resources associated with that are being offloaded. And at the end of the day, these are CPU intensive operations. Compression is actually a really interesting one because compression a lot of times you have to do the work and the end result might be no savings and you throw the data down on disk without actually using the compressed version. That's a lot of cycles that you have to execute to figure out if you can save any space. So if you're burning CPU with that constantly, that limits the amount of, of, uh, of actual business apps you can run. So when I drill down, too often data efficiency is a subjective theoretical conversation. So what I wanted to do is talk about it in, in terms of trade-offs. So if we start with post-process and we look at the, the efficiency around post-process post deduplication, 
if we look at this equation on the left hand side effectively you have inputs on the right hand side you have results so on the left hand side you need some sort of algorithm to do your post process deduplication you have to invest CPU resources to do that right? you have to do work to, to deduplicate the data and then you have to invest hard drive IOPS because if you're doing post processing you're writing it to disk you're coming back later and you're reading it off disk you're processing it and then you're potentially making more changes to disk so at the end of the day you're consuming more disk IOPS uh, why are you doing it? What, what is the goal? The end result is hard drive capacity, right? So, uh, so this uh, should say hard drive capacity eventually, because you don't get it immediately. So you're chewing those IOPS by writing it down, processing, reading it back, etc. At the end of the day, if you're consuming hard drive IOPS here as kind of input into this, this work process, the result on the other side is you don't have as many IOPS available for your applications. Right? In the end of the day, if you are, uh, if you are IOPS limited, and there are, there are use cases all the time when a system is going to be IOPS limited, if you're consuming them to do deduplication with the objective of capacity reduction, then you're consuming IOPS. So there is no free lunch, right? Everything is a trade-off. And the investment for, for traditional post-process deduplication is you, you exchange hard drive IOPS and CPU resources for an eventual reduction in hard drive capacity. So what about compression? Compression actually looks remarkably similar. Post-process is going to consume CPU and IOPS for the same reasons we talked about on, on the dedupe side. And the net effect will be eventually you decrease your hard drive capacity. And with that, unfortunately, your, your application IOPS that are available as well. So it's an exchange, and what you're deciding in for either of these algorithms is that you have a capacity problem. Right? And if the objective is to get that capacity down eventually, that's a, a motivation to deploy this type of technology. What about the inline technologies, right? So these are very different, and the, and the charts look quite different. The exchange, what you're investing and what you're getting back are very different. So in this case, you need an inline deduplication algorithm of some sort. You invest CPU to do that. And then what's the result? The result is you eliminate at IOPS, right? You didn't, if you're doing that deduplication inline, Every time you figure out that you don't need to, uh, to write this piece of data, you're saving IOPS into the environment. So, that, so that's a big deal. That's, that's good. We saved hard drive IOPS. Hard drive capacity is, in, is decreased as well. Uh, in this case, instantly, you, know, you didn't consume the capacity and free it up. You just you never consumed it. The downside here is that your latency goes up. Right? So what you're paying in, in, uh, in CPU processing comes back in uh, is increased latency, and these two things always go together, right? If, you're, if you increase your latency, the available application IOPS inherently drop within the environment. So the objectives here, if your objective is to reduce your, uh, the, ops, the number of IOPS going to your hard drive, and to reduce the hard drive capacity to become more efficient here, this is a significant uh, benefit, as long as you can accept the performance implications that come with it. Uh, this should probably have one more note on it that says WAN savings, because if you're replicating inline versus post-process, it can be a big difference for replication, because you're not pushing the same data to the remote side to process it yet again. And then, not surprisingly, similar to the other slide, inline compression has really the same trade-offs. Slightly different results, but the core components are the same. You're investing CPU with the objective of reducing your hard drive IOPS and reducing your hard drive capacity. So SimpliVity doesn't take any of these approaches. The objective of, of delivering the accelerator is actually free lunch. So if you add the OmniStack accelerator into these equations, all the CPU penalties that came with all the inline data processing that was done are all moved onto the accelerator. Now you get the reduction in, high, in, in IOPS, you get the hard drive capacity reduction in line, you never consume that capacity. Your latency in the environment drops because you're doing less I.O. and because you're offloaded all that CPU. And the number of available IOPS to your actual applications goes up because you're treating those, the devices, the, store, the actual storage media, more efficiently within the environment. Uh, so that was the core, or one of the core concepts behind the design of, of the system. Doing this uh, on host CPU, uh, the algorithms run. The problem is the equations look like this. So 
the the outcomes are not uh, are not what you're looking for, depending on what the what you're looking for for benefits. So we believe there's a huge benefit on the performance side. Testing testing shows it as well. Maybe could you quantify that? Like, is what's the difference in latency? Yeah, so we get that question sometimes. It's it's actually it's not as simple to answer as that. So we've we've done a lot of tests that actually show the differences, and it, at some point we may we may publish some of those results because they are pretty interesting. The, the challenge is it's, it's a mix. Uh, it's a mix of performance and predictability. So one of the things that came out of um, a lot of testing that we did in this space is when you do uh, performance testing with our accelerator, your performance is very predictable. You're acknowledging rights as soon as they hit the card. Yeah, you're, well, so let's separate that for a minute. So we'll, we'll come back and talk about that aspect. But if we, if we just look at, let's for a minute say that there was some other way to fast acknowledge the right. The predictability of hardware is a powerful thing, right? I, our hardware engineering team, right? So this is this is not an off-the-shelf card. Clearly, this is uh, this was designed by our guys. The they know exactly to the microsecond how long it's going to take when an I, when a request goes to the card and when it comes back. That predictability allows you to have performance that's extremely predictable uh, and reproducible. And if you look at the requirements of those enterprise customers, if we rewind um, back to talking about where we're being deployed, predictability is a big deal. Right? So performance charts that, that do this, those customers get really uncomfortable. Performance charts that look like this help them sleep at night. Uh, so that's another big, big aspect of it. Can that card be a point of failure, or is it like highly available in terms of the components and everything, the way it's structured on? So every write into an OmniCube goes into a second cube. So any type of failure in, a, in an OmniCube, whether it's a more likely scenario, power supplies, motherboards, hard drives, flat rate, all those components are far more likely to fail, uh, would, could potentially take a cube offline. Mm -hmm but not take your data offline. So we'll drill down into uh, some of the high availability scenarios, but a, a card failure, and I, we have a video of this, I don't know if it's been posted online yet, a card failure uh, will actually be handled gracefully by the system. We, the, the system can go, uh, actually I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go into the details because I don't have the picture to support sure. it. Then a few slides ahead, there's a picture that actually shows more of the details. Just one real quick, uh, so on a read, is that, is that card handling the uh, uh, most recently used algorithms, the uh, things that Nope. Usually so the card's not in the read path. Right. So, so if the card fails, do I lose access to my data at that point, or is yeah, so it still the, accessible? Yeah, so if the card the fails, on, then that host that uh, will stop serving data locally, okay. the host will continue to serve data by talking to its so neighbors it within the data center and serve data. But everything on the card that's stored is... Uh, Put it technically. Right. So if, if, your, if your card spontaneously fails for some reason. Right. Uh, you, or the you PCI can, bus or whatever. Right. Well, so that, I mean, that's motherboard fails, whatever, the PCI connection. It depends on the scenario. If, um, if what happened is it's some type of component failure that just takes the card offline, then when you come back, everything's there. It's, what the super caps are designed to do is to flush anything important to persistent storage into flash on the card. We can sit as long as you want. When you pie power, we come back up. Uh, if the uh, um, if the failure scenario was you know someone poured thermite on your card and the card's never coming back again, uh, <laughs> then yes, the data that was on that card will not be recoverable. In, that, in that event, but, would but you all put that data just to, to finish that, all that data by definition exists on another system within the data center. I see. So because of that redundancy, you don't have the need to pause the VM or something like that. Correct. Whereas if, if right, it's the only card, to... it would be probably best practice to pause the VM and say, yeah, this yeah. is your known good state, sorry. Yeah, I mean, so any, even traditional storage systems that have, you know, historical dual controller storage systems, when one card fails, services come up on the other, uh, the other controller, off and running. So you would see a similar kind of behavior, except instead of uh, one to one, it's, you know, one to N within an environment. But no VSS. With no what? No VSS. With no, and, uh, no, no, the, no, nothing. No, IP is just fail depending on the level of failure. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if there's, uh, if it's something that we detect and we offline the card ourselves, you can continue to process I/O even if the card, uh, again, you, someone decides to drop thermite on your system. 
uh, then in that case, obviously, your VMs continue to run. You're, as long as the thermite doesn't hit your motherboard uh, and take out the rest of the host, you're fine. Mm -hmm. In which case, they'll just access it through another uh, cube within the environment.